Hello and welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School. I am John Lomakang. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Every week we appreciate you tuning in to mm -hmm. listen to what God has to say through us and we take that humbly with great responsibility. We hope that we're leading you and guiding you to know Christ better and to give your life to Him as your Savior. Mm -hmm. We have a wonderful panel today. Some of them you know and some of them are new. But right to my immediate left is Jill Morricone, Vice President of 3ABN. Good to have you here, Jill. Thank you, Pastor John. Glad to be here. And my title for Monday is the same as the overall title of the lesson, The Everlasting Gospel. Praise God. And the lady from Texas, Shep uh, Gwynn. Uh, the hair from Texas. <laughs> um, I have Tuesday's lesson, A Story of Grace. Okay. And a face that may be new, but some of you will get to know more. Daniel Perrin, he's in our pastoral department, taught for many years Bible. Good to have you here today. Thank you, Pastor John. Uh, I have Wednesday's lesson giving us the scope of what we're studying into all the world. Mm -hmm. And on my other bookend, The Other Son of Thunder, Boom. Pastor James Rafferty, good to see you, James. Good to be here, John. Yes. I have Thursday's lesson and it is entitled, A Mission Movement. Okay, that's right. Praise the Lord for that. Well, why don't you have our opening prayer for us today, James? All right, let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for this everlasting gospel message, the three angels' messages that's to go to all the world, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, no one being left out. We thank you for the promise of your spirit to guide our hearts and the hearts of our viewers. We pray that you will be with us, that you will teach us and instruct us, comfort us, guide us into all truth. We ask these things now in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our memory text is Revelation 14, verse 6. If you have your Bibles, turn there with us. You know, when we talked about the three cosmic messages, that's just a portion, a slice mm -hmm. of the message of Revelation. Revelation is a book that is not a sealed book. Its title even reminds you that it's not a sealed book, the Revelation. But it's not a revelation of beasts and falling kingdoms and plagues, although those components are contained in it. It is a revelation of Jesus Christ. That's why this message is so vitally important and that's why this lesson is important. The everlasting gospel. You know, Revelation 13, 8, the lamb slain, Shelley. From the foundation of the earth. That's right. Shelley loves that. And that's the fact. Mm -hmm. Long before man fell into sin, there was a plan in place yeah. to save humanity in the event <coughs> that a wrong decision would be made. And God is never the kind that wants to put a fire extinguisher in the building after the fire starts. If we can do that before the fire, do you think that heaven could not think of that ahead of us? Mm -hmm. There was a plan in place to save humanity in the event that a wrong decision would be made. And praise the Lord today, the everlasting gospel says that regardless of who you are, where you're from and what you've done, mm -hmm. nobody's going to be lost because they sinned but they will be lost because they did not repent mm -hmm. and were not converted and did not accept Jesus Christ. So let's look at that in the context of Revelation 14, verse 6. Beautiful. <laughs> then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. Notice the extent to every nation, tribe, mm -hmm. tongue, and people. Yes. You know, when I worked on the message, the book, The Three Angels' Messages in Summary, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I took on was to break down the components of Revelation 14, verse 6. I saw another angel. Now, for those of you that have never read Revelation, and I want to assume that somebody in the audience probably were told, don't read Revelation, it can't be understood. Well, that's not true. Revelation is the last piece of this drama of sin against salvation, this drama against truth, against uh, uh, error or light against darkness or darkness against light, I should say, or, or Satan against Christ. It is the final sentence. And the book is so very impertinent, uh, so pertinent, sorry, is that it reminds us how the story is going to end. Mm -hmm. But the beauty of the gospel is the Lord does not decide well, I just want to save a select group. No, we are reminded to every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every people. Because Romans 3 verse 23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we know that the gospel communicated to us is not one that's uh, a unique gospel in that, well, the Jews are saved and everybody else is lost. No, if you are human, you are under the same curse as in Adam all die. Even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. 
But the introduction that Pastor Finley put, and I appreciate it so much, haven't you, haven't you enjoyed oh, Pastor yeah. Finley? Mm -hmm. When you get to know him as a, as a man of God, he and his wife, Teeny, you understand that this is the result of many years mm -hmm. of a dedicated commitment to the Word of God. Listen carefully. He says, throughout the centuries, the chanting of the Shema, name of the prayer, based on the Hebrew word to hear, reminded the Jews of the spiritual vision that united them as a people and that strengthened their resolve to maintain their unique identity as worshipers of the one true God. Now, there were other nations surrounding the Jewish nation, but God had given them a specific function to carry the gospel to everyone, to all the nations. As, uh, let's go to Acts chapter 13. Let's look at that very quickly. Acts chapter 13, and the apostle Paul, Paul and Barnabas in the city of Antioch reiterated the purpose for which the Lord had chosen the Jewish nation. Keep in mind, and I say this in the context, the Ten Commandments are not just for the Jews, for all have sinned. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people say the Sabbath is just for the Jews. No, all of us are under the condemnation of sin. Therefore, all of us are called to be redeemed and to keep the commandments of God. Acts chapter, what did I say? Acts, cha Acts chapter 13. Look at verse 42. And... Um, Let's start with verse 46, because that shortened it. It says, Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. Mm. That was the purpose. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Mm. And so in the context of the everlasting gospel, God made the Jewish nation FedEx, <laughs> UPS, to get that gospel out, to disseminate it to the world. But they thought of it themselves as, we're the only ones that are worthy of it. Mm -hmm. But that's not the case. Listen to the continued introduction. For Seventh-day Adventists, the three angels' messages of Revelation 14 are our Shema, our prayer language. Mm -hmm. They are our identifying statement of faith. They define who we are as a people and describe our mission to the world. In short, our unique prophetic identity is outlined in Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12, the three angels' messages, all three of them. And believe me, they are potent, relevant, and necessary to understand in the closing hours of earth's history. He says, and it is here that we find our passion to proclaim the gospel to the world. And then he introduces the lesson. In this week's lesson, we will begin a detailed study of Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12, but we'll do so through the eyes of grace as we listen to God speaking to our hearts. And Sunday, this is the introduction to Sunday. When most people think about the Bible's last book, Revelation, they do not think about God's grace. When they consider God's last day message, their thoughts often turn immediately to frightening beasts, mystic symbols, and strange images. The book of Revelation scares as many people as it reassures which is unfortunate because it is indeed saturated with grace and filled with hope. That is, even amid the scary beast and warnings of persecution and the hard times ahead, God still gives us reasons to rejoice in his salvation. Amen? Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the first blessing of Revelation. Revelation 1, verse 1 to 3. Let's look at this. The focal point is brought out right away. Revelation 1, verse 1 to 3, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, to show to his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angels to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. And look at the blessing, the first of seven. Mm -hmm. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is at hand. So when you look at the beauty of Revelation, the blessing, the very first of seven blessings, you know, we talk about seven churches, seven angels, seven plagues, seven spirits, uh, seven trumpets, but there's a hidden component in Revelation called the seven blessings. And this is the very first one. You know, some of the other ones, the blessed is he that keepeth his garment. Uh, that's another one of the seven blessings. But what's the question? Here's what Pastor Finley poses to you as our audience. How do these verses together tell us about not just the book of Revelation, but about the everlasting gospel as well? Here are my quick takeaways. Revelation is all about Jesus. Yes. In it, his message to his people 
is especially applicable to his church in the last days. So not only is the gospel to go to the whole world, but the church is to proclaim that gospel to the whole world. Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom, what gospel? The everlasting gospel. Yes. What is that? Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now, let me make it very clear. We're not saved by grace plus works. <laughs> We're saved by grace through faith for good works. Works don't save us, but salvation without works is like James says, faith without works is dead. The evidence of our salvation is that we want to work for the Lord, mm -hmm. but don't put works before salvation. The work of salvation is an act carried out by Christ alone. That's justification. But in the sanctifying process, we must participate. The Lord never forces us to become what we do not desire to become. The other part is, Revelation is a grace-filled message of our end time hope. Through the book, Christ is described as the lamb slain. Yes. And finally, a blessing is promised to those who read, understand, and act on the truth that is revealed in it. Look at Revelation 1, verse 5 and 6. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. What kind of witness? Faithful. Faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, that is the firstborn who conquered death. Mm. He's the one that conquered death. And the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and I love this, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So let me summarize it again. In Christ, we are forgiven. That's yes. the everlasting gospel. That's right. Grace pardons our past mm -hmm. and gives us strength for the process of sanctification. Good. Salvation empowers our present and provides hope for our future. Mm -hmm. That is, in Christ, we are delivered from the penalty of sin. Mm -hmm. That's justification. Mm -hmm. But also, we are empowered for victory over the power of sin, justification, singular act, delivered from the penalty of sin immediately. But daily we are being delivered from the power of sin, sanctification, and we will be in his image to have eternal victory over the presence of sin. Remember those three Ps, immediate deliverance from the penalty, daily deliverance from the power, and eternal deliverance from the presence. That is the power of the everlasting gospel. And such as it is in the words of the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. Well, how do we get the victory? But thanks be to God mm. who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And how so? Revelation 12, verse 11. And they overcame him mm. by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor John. You were almost looking at my notes because I'm picking up right where you left off. I love that. Amen. On Monday, we look at the everlasting gospel. Thank you, Shelley, for this assignment. I'm very, I like this one. Um, Jill Morricone, I guess I need to give my name. We're looking at Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Revelation 14, 6. You read it. We're going to read it again. Okay. We're focused on two words in this passage. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. What is that everlasting gospel? Is the everlasting gospel for those who are cowering in sin, those stained and polluted with no way to get clean? Yes, it is. Is the everlasting gospel for those who struggle with addiction, trapped under the power of mm. sin? Yes, it is. Is the everlasting gospel for those tired of the world of sin that we live in and want to be free from sin's presence? Yes, it is. There's many definitions of the everlasting gospel, but I'm looking at the three that you ended with. The everlasting gospel is freedom from the penalty of sin. That's justification. That's forgiveness of sins. It is freedom. 
it is freedom from the power of sin, that's sanctification, mm -hmm. and victory over sin. And it's freedom from the presence of sin, as Pastor John just explained. That's glorification mm -hmm. or the final eradication of sin. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a danger of separating the gospel. Mm -hmm. Some people say all the gospel is is freedom from the penalty of sin. Mm -hmm. We don't worry about anything else. The only thing we have to focus on is freedom from the penalty of sin. And you know what? That saves us. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So works this freedom from the power of sin, that doesn't add to our salvation. We are saved by the blood of Jesus. Think about the thief on the cross. What happened to him? And that moment when he accepted the dying Messiah, Jesus, hanging on the cross next to him as his savior, he asked for forgiveness from those sins, he was justified. There's nothing salvific that you can add to that process. And when he died, he had no opportunity to walk out the sanctification process. We know that he will be in heaven. But yet some denominations and some even within our own church stay in this process of justification. The only thing we focus on is freedom from the penalty of sin. We never experience freedom from the power of sin. We say, Jesus saved me by grace through faith. All that matters is that we love other people. All that matters is that we're forgiven. And we lose sight that God loves us so much that he doesn't want us to stay the way he found us. He wants to change us into his image. Some people strive to live free from the power of sin without ever experiencing freedom from the penalty of sin. Hmm. I know what that was like. I spent years of my experience not having freedom from the power of sin, but striving for freedom from the power of sin, trying harder, gritting my teeth, seeking perfection without ever understanding that first I had to be free from the penalty of sin. And then when I discovered that, when I discovered the blood of Jesus covers me and his righteousness, the pendulum swung the other way for a bit. And all I focused on was this freedom from the penalty of sin. And I forgot that not only are we free from sin's penalty, but we also have to walk in newness of life. Okay. You see, the gospel is all three components. The everlasting gospel is freedom from the penalty of sin, yes, but it's also freedom from the power of sin and finally freedom from the presence of sin. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about the freedom from the penalty of sin. What is the penalty of sin? The wages of sin is death. The penalty of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. How was the penalty paid? You might be saying, my sins are many and I don't know how to get under from the weight of these sins. The penalty was paid by the blood of Jesus. Amen. There's so many verses to this effect, but I think of 1 Peter 1 verse 19. We were redeemed, Shelley, with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Jesus paid our penalty on the cross so that you and I could go free. It's Romans 3, Romans 3 verses 23 through 26. I love this and Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. To me, there are some of the most powerful statements of justification and righteousness by faith. If, uh, Romans 3, Romans Romans 3 verse 23, all have sinned. We're all under the penalty of sin. All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Verse 24, Romans 3, 24, being justified. There's that word justified, made right, brought back into right relationship with God. How? By his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The blood of Jesus cleanses you and I from all sin, whom God set forth as a propitiation. He stood in my place. His substitutionary death on the cross stood in my place by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who is faith in Jesus. Jesus fulfilled the claims of the law because the wages of sin is death while justifying the sinner if we have faith in him. 
So how can I be justified? Two things. Number one, you just ask for forgiveness for your sins. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, mm -hmm. he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Number two, you accept that forgiveness and the righteousness of Jesus by faith. Romans 5, verse 1, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Now that's freedom from the penalty of sin. Let's move to freedom from the power of sin. How do I experience freedom from the power of sin? Now we could do many verses here, but I want to give you four chapters from the book of Romans. Number one, how do I experience freedom from the power of sin? Number one, you need the Romans 6 experience. The Romans 6 experience is surrender, saying no to the old man or woman of sin, uh, putting to death the old life. It's surrender. The old man of sin being crucified with Jesus, that our body of sin would be done away with. It says, he who has died has been freed from sin. So the first step in freedom from the power of sin is the Romans 6 experience, which is surrender of my own will, my own way to Jesus Christ. The second step in freedom from the power of sin is the Romans 8 experience, which I call empowerment. It's saying yes to Jesus. It's the infilling of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. You see, you can say, okay, I'm going to surrender my will. I'm going to surrender my way. I'm going to put to death the old person of sin, but you can't do that without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verse 1 who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. In Romans 8 verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. What does that mean? The presence of the spirit in the life of the believer subdues the sinful desires of our bodies. Step number three to experience freedom from the power of sin is the Romans 13 experience. Okay. And I call this intentionality. It's making no room for temptation and making choices for Christ. It's casting off the works of darkness and putting on the armor of light. It's putting on the Lord Jesus Christ and making no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. You see, we can have the Romans 6 experience and put to death the old woman or man of sin. We can have the Romans 8 experience and say, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But if, for instance, your struggle is alcohol and you say, okay, I'm not going to do that, but yet I'm going to work in a bar or I'm going to have alcohol in my home, that is not being intentional in the choices that we make for Christ. It is being intentional, making no room for temptation in your life. And finally, number four, I call the Romans 10, 17 experience, which is study the word of God. Make time. Not only do we put to death the old life of sin, not only do we ask for the infilling of the Holy Spirit, not only do we make choices for Christ, but you and I need to daily study the word of God because through that we can truly become empowered to live, get freedom from the power of sin. And one day coming soon, you and I will have freedom from the presence of sin. The hope of the gospel is eternal life forever with Jesus. Revelation 21, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. There will be no more sin. We will spend eternity with Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jill. Wow. I'm waiting to see what's going to happen when Shelly gets loose. This is a topic we all love, the everlasting gospel. Don't go away. We'll be right back in just a few moments. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3 Abian Sabbath School panel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We're going to go to Shelley Quinn, The Story of Grace. Oh, I'm so excited. Once again, I'm Shelley Quinn. And I just have to say to you that 
the entire Bible is the story of God's love, God's righteousness, and God's grace. And that's something that a lot of people fail to see in the Old Testament, but it's there. What is grace? Grace is the unearned, undeserved favor of God. And you know what Paul said in 2 Timothy 1, 9, grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, mm -hmm. before the world was formed. Salvation has always been by grace, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the three angels message is the most important message. This is the continuation of God's grace. The most important message that needs to be going around the world. And that foundation of that message is the everlasting gospel mm -hmm. of righteousness by faith through the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ and through his intercession as our high priest. Let's read Revelation 14, 6 again. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. You cannot understand or accept the rest of the message of the first angel or the warnings of the second and third angel if the everlasting gospel is not the foundation. You, you've got to know what is the everlasting gospel. It is the good news of the everlasting covenant of God for salvation. Here's my favorite scripture. I'm going to read it in its entirety. Revelation 13, 8. Mm -hmm. It's talking about the beast power and then the one who gives uh, the, the, the other earth power. And it says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, the one who sets up the image to the beast, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. In eternity past, before God created the world, God, the Father, Son, and Spirit made a determination. One of them would come to earth, become a human, and pay our penalty for our sin. You know, when God created us in his image, the greatest gift he ever gave us was free will. Now, some people say, well, why free will? Why, if, we're, if, if he could foresee possibly that we were going to sin, why give us free will? Because God is love. First John 4, 8, God is self-sacrificing love. First John 1, 5 says that God is light. That is his character of righteousness. And a loving and righteous God knew that love could not be forced. He created us that we would have a reciprocal love relationship with him. He created us hoping that as he demonstrated his love, his righteousness, and his grace, we would choose to be in an intimate relationship with him. He knew free will was risky. Yeah. But you know what? When Adam and Eve sinned when they disobeyed God. Their spiritual virginity was lost. There was no way that they could become righteous on their own again. Fig leaf aprons weren't going to cover their sin. So what did God do? It's an amazing thing. He comes to them in Genesis 3.15 and he announces the everlasting gospel. He says that the seed of the woman, he's talking about Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Christ, would crush the head of the Satan. But then what he did was so amazing. The next thing he did was he made articles, skins, coverings for them, cloaks for them from the skins of a sacrificed lamb. And you know what? 
immediately, as soon as he did that, he put the substitutionary sacrificial system in place that opened the pathway to righteousness by faith. It pointed to the coming Messiah. Adam, Eve, their son Abel, Enoch, Seth, Enosh, uh, Noah, Shem, Job, were all made righteous. God calls them righteous. They couldn't restore their own righteousness. It was righteousness by faith in the coming Messiah. Now I have to point out something. You are probably familiar that Paul calls Abraham the father of us all. In Genesis 15, 6, it says that Abraham believed God and God counted it to him as righteousness. We don't know how old he was there, somewhere between 75 after God had first call, or called him again from, uh, and after, from Haran, but he was before the age of 84 because he, had, he hadn't had Ishmael yet. But guess what? Here he's made righteous by faith. And then in Genesis 17, God comes to Abraham. And you know what he says? This is when Abraham's 99. Mm. So this is years after this righteousness by faith to your point. You can't just be justified by faith. God comes to Abraham and he says, I'm the Lord God Almighty. This is Genesis 17, 1. Walk before me and be blameless. What? God has always expected his people to walk in obedience motivated by love and loyalty. And let me tell you something. You clearly see all 10 commandments in the book of Genesis. When God renewed this everlasting covenant with Ish, uh, Isaac, mm -hmm. you know why he did? Genesis 26 verse 5 says, because God's telling Isaac, I'm renewing this because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Mm -hmm. See, righteousness by faith is a relational term. God is righteous. The way he relates to us is by righteousness. The way we relate to him is by righteousness. And the goal of the everlasting covenant that was announced in the garden, ratified in vision with Abraham, it's all throughout the Old Testament. And then Jesus comes to renew this everlasting covenant and ratify it by his own blood. The goal is 2 Corinthians 5, 21, where he says he made him who knew no sin right. to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So here's the point I want to make in the short time I have left. We are made righteous to practice righteousness. Our destiny is to become like Jesus. Yeah. Psalm 85, 13 says, Righteousness goes before him and makes his footsteps our pathway. First John 2, 6 says, He who abides in him ought also to walk just as he walked. First John 2, 29 says, If you know he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. And First John 3, 7 says, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. That's right. I want to tell you something. Obedience can only be done by grace. Mm -hmm. It is God who works in us to will and to do his good pleasure. It is God who fills us with the Holy Spirit. Yes, he delivered us, justified us, declared us not guilty by the blood of Jesus. But the Bible says it is the blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Father who sanctify us. And only can we be delivered from the power of sin by the grace of our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Shelley. The story of grace.
We have the everlasting gospel, but who is it for? Who gets to receive it? I'm Daniel Perrin, and I, you might be watching this from your own living room, but the title of this lesson takes us into all the world. And I, when I was growing up, I went to a school, a Seventh Avenue school, where every Monday we said the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. And uh, uh, the very last line there, uh, with liberty and justice for all. Now, now, whether or not we as a nation have you know, enacted that, we recognize that liberty that is just for a few is not really liberty. And the same is true spiritually, that uh, the problem of sin is universal. It's spread everywhere. And if there's gonna be a solution, it better be universal too. An old Christmas song says that he came to make the blessing flow far as the curse is found. Not just part way. Titus 2.11 says, for the grace of God, that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Three letter word there, all, maybe among one of the most important words of the Bible, that everyone is to receive it. And unless we think that this is just a New Testament idea, the Testaments are united and they speak together here back in Isaiah 45, verse 22. God speaking here saying, look to me and be saved all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. And God is not going back on this, not at this critical and crucial time where we are right now, not with all he has paid for every life, for every soul, for every person. And so we come to three cosmic messages and they are sent out flying in mid heaven. If we go back the chapter before Revelation 14, there are two beasts that we see. One that covers the earth and one arising from the sea, a political and a religious power. And they seem to have it covered. They got the land and the sea. They, they got everything taken care of. And yet what we discover is that God sends his message flying in the midst of heaven that uh, the Lord is still the Lord of the heavens and he is Lord over all the earth. And so when Jesus speaks about the time of the end and things that we can anticipate, things that are coming, uh, he says there in Luke 21, 28, now when you see these things about to happen, where do you look? Up. You look up, That's right. lift up your heads, your redemption draws near because the, the good news message is something that will be visible to all. Now, people can try to claim a little bit of earth and people do all the time, but you can't claim the air. Right. The, the, the message in mid heaven disperses through the air. It's going to be for everybody. Geography is not a hindrance to God. The lines we draw on maps mean nothing to him as far as stopping the gospel presentation. Everybody is gonna hear this message in some way. Now, before Jesus returns, uh, the world will be divided. Everybody will have a chance to make a choice. There's not gonna be a third group of people that didn't have opportunity to hear, to receive the message in some way. This is a big task. Mm. The world is big. This is way bigger than me. But have you ever wanted to be a part of something that's bigger than yourself? Like you, want, you want to do something that matters, something that's going to make a difference. We talk about leaving a legacy of something that's going to be, going to be critical and useful. Well, the three angels, this cosmic message is saying to us, now is that time. This is that time that something that you can be a part of, be useful in something that's going to make a big difference. This unites people with angels with the very message of God spoken through Jesus, coming through his prophets, the greatest task ever undertaken. Any building project, any government project out there, it's nothing compared to this here. And so before Jesus leaves this earth, among the last things he says to his disciples, Acts chapter one, verse eight, says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in Samaria, and to all the ends of the earth. Mm -hmm. He says this to disciples who'd never been more than 100 miles from their home. Mm -hmm. How could they even contemplate and comprehend the, the size of an earth 24,000 miles around at its equator with a population of 8 billion people and growing? Mm -hmm. I don't have a very big sphere of influence. I've been to South America once, but other than that, I, I don't travel. 
how, how big is this message? Can it ever be done? And I want you to know that God thinks, God knows this message can be done. He tells us in each of the gospels, listen to this here, Matthew 28, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Mark 16, 15, he said to them, go into all the world and preach to every creature. Luke 24, verse 47 and 48, that uh, repentance and remission of sins to be preached in his name to all nations. John 20, verse 21, as the Father has, as the Father has sent me, so I also sent you. All right, Paul gets the same message that in Acts 26, verse, uh, verse 16 and 17, says to, to whom I now send you to the Gentiles to open their eyes. Isaiah 49, verse six, is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel? I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. And then hear this three angels message to be preached to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. There's not very many more categories perhaps you can use, but it's covering it all. Yes, but how? I talked to somebody on the phone last week that said, is this even possible? Mm. Is it, I mean, can we even do this? Sure, there are difficulties out there. 97% of the unreached people of the world live, live in what's called the 1040 window, 10 degrees north to 40 degrees north latitude, an area of the world you could look that up and figure out what that is. Mostly poor, the biggest unreached cities, places where the message has not been preached. But I wanna share with you, the message will go out and here's why. Number one, along with the message comes the power and it's through the Holy Spirit. Jesus says in John 15, 16, you didn't choose me, I chose you, I appointed you. He right. takes responsibility for this message and says, I go along with you. All right, number two, this is not a task for institutions only. This is a task for individuals and everybody has a sphere of influence. And God may be talking to you right now or sometime in the near future as our ears are open saying, take your sphere of influence and move it somewhere else. Too much light shining in one place. You gotta go out and spread your sphere of influence. He tells the, the, his disciples there in Acts 1.8, start in Jerusalem, start with those you know. Who do you know? Sure, you may not be able to communicate with people over there, but you've got people right here. Right. Number three, we've got literature that needs to go out. The silent witness, you can't sit in their home, but as you give out something, they read it. And maybe it doesn't produce fruit right away, but as the things that take place that are predicted and prophesied begin to happen, that silent witness begins to move on their minds. All right, radio and TV. All right, literally, that's cutting through the air across languages. And we may not be aware of it, but there are stories of people hearing this message saying, ah, my heart is awakened. My mind begins to understand what God is telling me. And God is working through these things. Digital technologies, almost everyone has a phone. And with the way this world is going, everybody is going to have a phone or something like that. And I'm not limiting God to say how he can work or in what ways, but uh, there is the ability for information to be transmitted in ways that could not have been possible in the past. And not that God is reliant upon our technologies, but there is possibilities out there. There are long-term missionaries right now expanding into other countries. And this is not just a spur, a, a, a quick spur of activity going on, spending 20 years getting to know a language and a people group to understand their customs. And God may be calling you to say, yes, I'm, my sphere of influence is to move into a location in a place where I can share with people who've never heard it. Paul wanted to go off to Spain where nobody had heard the name of Jesus. God is speaking to people in dreams. He has in the past and he will continue. We see that in Acts chapter two and Joel chapter two. In Matthew chapter 20, verses one to 16, there is a vineyard owner and he goes out and gathers workers throughout the day. And even at the 11th hour, right before the close of the day, he is inviting workers into the vineyard. God will call, he is calling. And if you're watching right now and you're one of those saying, I'm not trained. I've been sitting around, I haven't learned enough. 
God is calling 11th hour workers. And I want to read you this really quickly here. Sixth volume of the testimonies, page 202. As the children sang in the temple courts, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So in these last days, children's voices will be raised to give the last message of warning to a perishing world. When heavenly intelligences see that men are no longer permitted to present the truth, the spirit of God will come upon the children and they will do a work in the proclamation of the truth, which the older ones could not do because their way is hedged up. God is working through one and all and may it be you. Amen. 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 That was powerful. And we're just going to continue with that theme. I have Thursday's lesson. My name is James Rafferty and it is entitled A Mission Movement. We are looking at Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, the everlasting gospel that's to go into every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Every single one of them. No one is left out. This is a mission movement. And God is in earnest with us. He's in earnest with the entire world because he wants every single person to hear the everlasting gospel. You know, the world is filled with all kinds of religions today. There are 1.3 billion Catholics. There are about a billion Muslims. There are 260,000 Orthodox. There are about 800,000 Protestants. We have billions of religions just within the Christian realm, never mind other relig religious persuasions. And God has one specific message that's to go to every single nation, every single tongue. It is a message that brings down what the Bible calls in Revelation 14, verse 8, confusion. Mm -hmm. Confusion about God and confusion about salvation. It is called the everlasting gospel. And it's a very unique phrase. You won't find that phrase anywhere else in the Bible. It's not in the Old Testament. It's not in the New Testament. The, close, the closest you can get to it is everlasting salvation in Isaiah 45 or in Hebrews chapter 13, everlasting covenant, which are basically the same thing. But God used this specific phrase for a reason because he knew that God's end time church would be challenged in the end time scenario to bring these three cosmic messages to all the world. He knew we would be challenged by one specific thing that all these other religions seem to either leave out or present. And that is the idea that the gospel is everlasting. If you go and knock on someone's door in Indonesia or in the nations of Europe or in South America or Central America or Asia or Australia or North America, if you go and knock on their door and you introduce them to this beautiful message of the everlasting gospel and you start to tell them all about how this gospel leads to a people who keep the commandments of God, as well as the faith of Jesus. If you start to share with them, as we've been talking about here, not only the, the uh, deliverance from the penalty of sin, but also from the power of sin to live a sanctified life in Jesus Christ. You start sharing that and almost immediately, you're gonna find people closing that door. You're gonna find people closing those ears. You're gonna find people basically saying to you, you know what? That's old covenant. I mean, if they're Protestants, if they're evangelicals, if they're into grace, that's old covenant. You know, we don't follow the law of God. We are under grace. It's a dispensation, don't you know? It's a dispensation of the new covenant. We're under grace. And a lot of times we as Seventh-day Adventists will respond to that and say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me prove to you. I can prove to you from the scriptures that the law is still binding. I can prove to you from the New Testament that the law is still binding. I can prove to you that the law wasn't just for the Jews. I can go back before there was ever a Jew and show that God's people kept the law. We reason and we argue from this perspective, but there's another way we could possibly approach this. If someone is actually responding by saying, you know, we're under grace now. That's the old covenant. Law keeping is old covenant. We're under the new covenant. We're saved by grace. We could actually respond and say, well, are you suggesting then that was a time when we were saved by obedience to the law? Are you suggesting that there was a time when people were actually saved by law obedience, but now, since Jesus were saved by grace and not by the law? And they might respond and say, yeah. And you might want to share with them, well, if uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2 says that the gospel was preached unto them as well as unto us. 
And Galatians chapter 3, verse 8 says that Abraham had the gospel preached unto him. Amen. You see, this is the everlasting gospel. It's the only way anyone ever has been saved or ever will be saved. It's the way of salvation. Jesus Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Old Testament faithful look forward to Christ. The New Testament faithful look back to Christ. But everyone's looking to the cross. Amen. Everyone's looking to Jesus. And so when you see this phrase, the everlasting gospel, in the book of Revelation chapter 14, we are re being reminded by God that God has a specific purpose for putting that phrase right here in the center of these three cosmic messages. He's seeking to awaken an understanding of the way of salvation from the very beginning, from the very foundation of the world. You might ask the question, well, where's the gospel in the Old Testament. I understand the gospel of the New Testament because you know, we have the cross, we have Calvary. Where's the gospel in the Old Testament? Well, it is everywhere. The whole sanctuary service was gospel. That whole system was all about the gospel. It was pointing to the lamb, to Jesus Christ, the lamb. Adam and Eve sinned and immediately you had the sacrificial system put into place. You had the animal skins that came from the sacrifice for their sins, again, pointing to the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. In fact, the gospel is found in the heart of the Ten Commandment law. Amen. If you go to Exodus chapter 20, and you're going to find this in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. If you go there and you read the Ten Commandments, you're going to find that the Ten Commandments actually teach the very same thing that we see taught in the New Testament, that we keep God's commandments because we love Him. And we love Him because He first loved us. Yes. In other words, it is love that motivates obedience to God's commandments. God loves us, we love Him, and if we love Him, we keep His commandments. That's 1 John 4, verse 19, and John 14, verse 15, and thank you, Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. We're not there yet, but we'll get into Revelation 14, verse 12 a little bit later in our study. So, you go to the law of God in Exodus chapter 20 and you read, you begin reading, I, the, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And you have to think to yourself, well, how did God do that? How did God bring them out of the house of bondage? How does God bring us out of our bondage? How does God bring us out of our sin? How does God bring us out of the chains of vice? How does he deliver us from the bondage of sin? Well, he delivers us by the blood of the lamb. We overcome by the blood of the lamb. How did he deliver his people out of Egyptian bondage? Well, he had these plagues that he sent on the Egyptians. And when the 10th plague came, it was the death of the firstborn. And the only way you could be preserved, delivered from the death of the firstborn was through the blood of the lamb, the Passover blood of the lamb. The children of Israel and even believing Egyptians had to take a lamb and slay it and put the blood on the doorposts and lentils. In other words, God's people were delivered by the blood of the lamb in the Old Testament, just like we're delivered by the blood of the lamb in the New Testament. There's nothing new here, according to Revelation 14, verse 6. This is the everlasting gospel. It's the only way we've ever been saved. And as they were delivered by the blood of the Lamb, God delivers them through the Red Sea, he takes them out of the wilderness. They're there at Mount Sinai. He thunders with a, a mighty voice. They, they tremble in fear before him and he speaks these 10 words. But before he speaks these 10 words, he reminds them of something. What does he remind them of? His love, mm. his grace, his deliverance, the blood of the Lamb the everlasting covenant, the everlasting gospel, everlasting salvation. He says, I'm the Lord, your God, and I brought you, I delivered you by the blood of the lamb. I delivered you out of bondage. Therefore, don't have any other gods before me because the natural consequence of the gospel is obedience to the law. The natural consequence of the gospel is the fruit of obedience. That's what comes out of being saved in Jesus Christ. And if we're not saved in Jesus Christ, and if we're not keeping the law of God, we're not saved in Jesus Christ because in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, in both places, Exodus chapter 20, beginning with verse 1, and Revelation 14, beginning with verse 6, in both of those places, we see a people who end up keeping the commandments of God. And that in both places, that comes out of a reminder of the everlasting gospel that God brings to them, to their notice in relationship to the blood of the Lamb. 
And so we see this cosmic message that's going to go to all the world in these last days to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. It's going to break down all of the barriers. As uh, Mark says, Mark Finley says here in this uh, lesson, he says, the preaching of the everlasting gospel leaps across geographical boundaries. It penetrates the earth's remotest areas. It reaches people of every language and every culture. And eventually it will impact the entire world. Mm -hmm. That is the power of the everlasting gospel, the power to deliver God's people from Egyptian bondage is the same power that God has to today to deliver us from whatever bondage right. we are in. Amen. 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 Thank you, James. Wow. That gives us a little extra time, Jill. It's a powerful, the closing thought is on your mind. It's a powerful study. I just want to remind you that the same God who can forgive us of our sins, who can justify us, that same God can free us from the power of sin. He works in us and through us to do his good pleasure, and he can sanctify us by his grace. Amen. You know, the Bible's really clear that God keeps covenant with those who keep covenant with him. His covenant is a covenant of grace. We talk about free grace, but let me, I want you to consider the cost of grace. First Peter 1, 18 through 20, knowing that you were redeemed, not with corruptible things like silver and gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ mm -hmm. as a, li a lamb, without blemish and without spot. The spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Let me tell you, grace is undeserved, but don't ever think of yourself as unworthy because you are worth nothing less than the price that he paid for you mm -hmm. with his own blood. You know, when you think about the scope of the mission that stands before us, you might say to yourself, I, I can't do much. And God is not calling you to do everything, but he's calling you to say, I'm available. Mm -hmm. And before the disciples were told to go, they were told to come. And the coming is to sit at the feet of Jesus and to learn from his word. And you can use this time to, to make yourself uh, available to other mission organizations. I think about Adventist Frontier Missions, Adventist World Radio Gospel Outreach, Adventist World Aviation, others, and put yourself on their mailing list and say, I want to know what's going on so I can pray for it too. Amen, amen. The everlasting gospel will break down every barrier. Our job is to be lifting up Christ, lift him up before the world and allow him to draw all people unto him. Thank you so much, everyone, for disseminating the everlasting gospel that we'll continue to proclaim. But Paul says it's the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generation, but now has been revealed to his saints. Mm -hmm. Colossians 1, verse 26. Join us next time for the lesson, Fear God and Give Glory to Him as we continue in this three cosmic messages. We look forward to seeing you then.